and welcome to the latest episode of the Green Left News Podcast. I'm Ben Radford and I'm joined by Isaac Nellist and we're going to take you through the news from across the country and around the world. If you haven't heard of Green Left, it's a people-powered media project that's been running for more than 30 years. We centre the voices of activists and provide an alternative to the corporate media. And become a Green Left supporter today at greenleft.org.au slash support and help us continue doing the work we do. Before we begin, we acknowledge that we're recording on stolen Gadigal Wongal land. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land and Green Left is committed to supporting the struggles for First Nations justice across the country and around the world. As the climate crisis rages on and those in power continually refuse to take the meaningful action that is desperately needed, people are taking matters into their own hands. On April 16, more than 100 climate activists stopped a coal train in the port of Newcastle for five hours. 15 activists, including a blind man and an 81-year-old woman, climbed on top of the coal train and even began shoveling coal out of the train. The protest was organised by Rising Tide, which had previously organised a four-day climate camp in Mulumbimba or Newcastle, that was attended by about 300 activists. Police charged the protesters who climbed on or around the coal train, but activists are determined to continue taking action to save the climate. Another example of this climate action was in Borlu, or Perth, where 200 people marched through the CBD demanding an end to fossil fuels and a funded transition to renewables. And the march ended with a sit-down outside the offices of the fossil fuel giant Woodside Energy. Yeah, in the last episode, we talked about the rallies that took place across the country that were organised by construction industry unions, including the CFMEU. One of the demands at these rallies was the ban of uh, construction products that contain silica, which is a dangerous substance linked to silicosis, lung disease and cancer. And the Australian Council of Trade Unions is supporting the campaign to ban the product with the Assistant Secretary Liam O'Brien saying, with alternatives readily available, why are we risking the lives of tradies for a fashionable finish in our kitchens? And the campaign is also being supported by uh, various public health organisations. In some good news from the unions, uh, the Maritime Union of Australia has welcomed the decision by the tugboat company Spitzer to abandon its legal action to try and cancel a 2019 enterprise bargaining agreement of almost 600 tugboat workers. And if that legal challenge was successful, it would have included big pay cuts uh, as well as fewer safety and fatigue management measures, as well as less job security. And MUA Assistant National Secretary Jamie Newland said that Spitzer's decision means that they can now start working towards finalising a new agreement with the company. Yeah, that's good news. Um, allied health workers in Geelong have rallied outside the Barwon Health University Hospital against a proposed restructure. The unions are concerned that Barwon Health's new structure fails to include a chief allied health officer in an executive role. Um, the chief nursing role has been renamed as the chief nursing midwifery and allied health officer. However, only professional nurses can apply for the position, according to a draft seen by Green Left. Um, Victorian Allied Health Professionals Association Executive Officer Andrew Hewitt told the rally that allied health professionals must be represented at an executive level, otherwise decisions made do not take account of their work. In Western Australia, nurses and midwives from the Australian Nursing Federation are facing huge fines for taking strike action at the end of last year for better wages and conditions. And the Western Australian Industrial Relations Commission is threatening the union with fines of more than 27 million. And incredibly, the commission's lawyer compared the union's actions to those of Adolf Hitler. So all that for asking, just for asking for safer working conditions and a pay rise that matches inflation. Everybody's feeling the housing and rental crisis at the moment, and a new report released by Anglicare Australia has found that less than 1% of private rentals across the country are affordable for someone working full-time on the minimum wage. Um, their rental affordability snapshot has found that rents have risen by 11% over the past year, and that rents have never been less affordable. Um, shockingly, only four rentals across the country were affordable for someone on JobSeeker, and there were zero that were affordable for someone on youth allowance. 
a 0.4% are affordable for someone on age pension and 0.1% for someone on the disability support pension. That's pretty crazy. Oh, those are insane numbers. And meanwhile, we've got campaigns having to defend housing. Um, in in Mianjin, for example, activists have had to mobilise to defend this emergency accommodation. Um, about 70 people were going to be forced out of Big Bird backpackers due to the owner raising the rent. And so activists and residents have called on the Queensland government to fund the service. So just before we continue... Uh, Alex Bainbridge from Green Left has interviewed uh, Greens MP Max Chandler Mather about Labor's housing bill and the Greens' response uh, to that bill. You can check that one out on our podcast feed or you can watch the video on the Green Left website. And Build Tenant Power rang out through the streets of Mianjin on April 22 at a housing justice rally that was organised by the South East Queensland Union of Renters. Speakers called for action on the housing and rental crisis and held banners that said housing for people, not for profit, and no more evictions. Another campaign for housing is going on in Nam, uh, basically to save the Barak Beacon public housing estate, which is slated to be demolished by the Daniel Andrews government. And uh, Barak Beacon estate resident Margaret Kelly told Green Left Radio that the Victorian Labor government has abandoned its commitment to public housing. So the estate is planning to be knocked down in June, even though residents were only told about the demolition plan two weeks before Christmas. It's absolutely disgraceful that in the midst of a countrywide housing crisis, that public housing is being demolished instead of being built. Yeah, it's terrible. And um, I guess another response to the cost of living and housing crisis that could make a difference is uh, raising the rate of payments like JobSeeker and other welfare payments. But ahead of the upcoming budget in May, Labor has confirmed that it will not be looking to raise uh, these payments, despite its own Economic Inclusion Committee recommending it do so. So that committee confirmed what anti-poverty advocates have been saying for ages, which is that the rate of welfare payments is so low that it's actually a barrier to finding work. And now there's been an open letter that has more than 300 signatures calling on the government to raise the rate including seven Labor MPs who have broken ranks so far, as well as Greens and Independents. Treasurer Jim Chalmers has admitted that living on the low rates uh, of payment is tough, but still refusing to do anything about it. The day we're recording um, tomorrow, there's a anti-poverty rally outside Anthony Albanese's office calling for an urgent increase to job seeker and other payments. So hopefully a big turnout at that rally. In other news, students from the University of Sydney held a speak out to protest uh, Universities Australia's support for the AUKUS Military Alliance. It was also a response to Universities Australia CEO Catriona Jackson's trip to Washington DC to negotiate the Australian University's involvement in the development of the nuclear submarine deal. And Nick Raymer, uh, who's the UCID branch president of the NTEU, said that universities profess to be about social progress, not war. And this turn towards the war machine is just an opportunistic race for funding and that we should reject it outright. Um, Other speakers included representatives of the UCID Student Representative Council and other campus organisations. Another protest against uh, uni's involvement with militarism was in Mianjin, where current students and alumni attended the University of Queensland Senate meeting. Uh, basically protesting their involvement with the weapons giant Boeing. And Boeing, which is the world's third largest weapons corporation, is running a hypersonic missile program at one of the university's campuses. And its weapons are also used all over the world to commit atrocities in places like Yemen, Palestine and West Papua. Hundreds of people gathered at the Cataract Dam on April 16 to remember the Darawal men, women and children killed in the Appen Massacre in 1816. Soldiers led by Captain James Wallace killed at least 14 First Nations people under orders from New South Wales Governor Lachlan Macquarie. It's important we remember these atrocities committed by the Australian government. The Green Left Party, which is running in the May 14 Turkish general election, launched its campaign in Warung last weekend, basically to a large gathering of mainly Turkish citizens living in Australia. And the pro-Kurdish party 
is seeking to replace the current presidential system with a democratic one that features a pluralistic parliament with broad powers, as well as a robust separation of powers and also a democratic solution to the decades of persecution, discrimination and exclusion suffered by Kurds and other minorities in Turkey. Yeah, and Kurdish Australians and their supporters rallied at Sydney Town Hall on April 15 to call on the Australian government and other world powers to stand up against the isolation of Kurdish leader Abdullah Öcalan, who has been imprisoned by the Turkish state since February 1999. Uh, Australian Federation of Democratic Kurdish Society co-chair Gulfa Olan said that it was Öcalan's democratic, ecological and gender libertarian ideas that the Turkish regime and its supporters want to prevent with this isolation. Also in Morang, members of the Myanmar community and their supporters rallied to condemn the Myanmar coup regime's airstrikes against civilians. And speakers called on the Australian federal government to ban companies' involvement with the regime, impose trade sanctions, and support the Myanmar resistance fighters and recognise the national unity government, as well as refer the regime to the International Criminal Court for Crimes Against Humanity and finally to end Australia's involvement in military training and support for the regime. Palestinians and supporters marched through Orang protesting the violent attacks on worshippers at the Alaska Mosque in Jerusalem by Israeli occupation forces, which ramped up during the holy month of Ramadan. Community organisations sent a letter to the Anthony Albanese government criticising its silence and calling on it to join the worldwide condemnation of Israel. There was also backlash against Randwick City Council's decision to fly the state flag of Israel on April 26, which marks the 75th anniversary of Israel's foundation, which is the same day that Palestinians mark al-Nakba, or the catastrophe, when more than 750,000 Palestinians were systematically dispossessed and expelled. And Jews Against the Occupation sent an open letter to the council calling on them to reverse their decision particularly in the context of the brutal attacks on Palestinian people and Israel's current authoritarian regime. And they called on the council to fly the Palestinian flag instead. Yeah, and this brings us to an important upcoming event that's being marked across the country. On Saturday, May 13, there'll be rallies marking the 75th anniversary of al-Nakba, rallying against Israeli apartheid and the continued occupation of Palestine. So, so far, there are events in Warang, Mianjin, Nam, Borlu, Mulumbimba, and I'm sure there'll be more announced. Uh, so, check Green Left social media for details of these events and let us know if you're aware of more events planned in your town or city. And now, let's hear what's happening from around the world. The simmering tensions between Sudan's army and the powerful paramilitary rapid support forces, or RSF, boiled over into armed clashes on the morning of Saturday, April 15, following disagreements over the integration of the autonomous RSF into the army's command chain. The issue of integration was a key aspect of a deal that Sudan's ruling junta was to sign with right-wing civilian forces to share power. The army and the RSF have been working together to maintain military rule and protect it from the December Revolution of 2019. And during that period, the RSF has massacred hundreds of protesters outside the army headquarters. Yeah, more than 427 people have been killed and more than 3,700 have been injured since the fighting broke out. And 13 hospitals have been bombed. Tens of thousands have been displaced uh, from either fleeing the armed clashes or because of water and electricity shortages and many are fleeing to neighbouring countries, and there's also an international attempt to coordinate some evacuation efforts. And if you go to the Green Left Radio podcast feed, which you can also find online, uh, there's a great interview with a Sudanese activist, Sarah Sanada, who talks about how desperate the situation is in terms of people not able to get medical care, food, uh, even water shortages, and they're desperately calling out for international aid. And then we've also lined up an interview with Hoya Mabas from the United Sudanese Revolutionary Forces Abroad, 
which will give further insight into the current situation. That interview hasn't been conducted yet, but at the time you're listening, it should be available at greenleft.org.au. Yeah, definitely go and check those out. So on the on the podcast, we've covered a lot, the revolt in France that's going on, uh, but there's been some new developments since President Emmanuel Macron signed the pensions reform bill into law, which raises the pension age from 62 to 64. And so the demonstrations and blockades, which isn't which aren't just against the pensions, but they're also against the neoliberal government policies of the Macron government. And so these protests have continued particularly when Macron or his ministers have made any public appearances. For example, when Macron went to visit a school last week to make an announcement about teachers' pay, electricity workers cut the power, so he was forced to speak in the playground without a microphone. And unions have also called for huge protests for May the 1st or May Day to continue resisting the pensions law and protesting the Macron government. Yeah, massive solidarity with the uh, French protesters. Um, In the US, uh, in the wake of a a primary school shooting in Memphis, Tennessee, where three children and three teachers were killed, three Democrat legislators took part in a protest against gun violence on the floor of the state's House of Representatives in Nashville on March 30. And then in a shocking anti-democratic display, Republicans voted to expel two of those three um, Democrat legislators on April 6. So the two who were expelled, Justin Jones and Justin Pearson, are young and black and representing multiracial cities and serving their first terms in office. Whereas the third person, Gloria Johnson, who is white, said she avoided expulsion because of the color of her skin. Um, So before he was expelled, Jones said that this is not about expelling us as individuals. This is your attempt to expel the voices of the people from the people's house and it will not be successful. And according to local media, only eight lawmakers have been expelled previously and six of those were Confederates who were expelled in the 19th century for refusing to affirm the citizenships of previously enslaved black people. Also in the US, protests are continuing against the construction of a police training centre in Atlanta in Georgia, despite massive police repression as well as heavy-handed anti-protest laws that are being used against people opposing the facility. And the first phase of what protesters are calling Cop City is supposed to open later this year, and it's basically going to help further militarise the police and also in its construction involves a huge clearing of forest on unceded First Nations land. And police have been constantly harassing and using violence against the people opposing the centre. They even shot and killed a peaceful, unarmed protester in January. And while none of the police who shot the protester 57 times have faced any charges, at least 23 protesters have been charged under Georgia's draconian so-called domestic terrorism laws, basically for vandalising the Cop City construction site, which means that if they're convicted, they'll face up to 35 years in prison. Yeah, it's pretty scary stuff. Um, Over in Ireland, an Irish-Australian anti-war activist, Kieran O'Reilly, was arrested outside Dublin Castle on April 13. They were attempting to deliver a two-metre-long key to Julian Assange's prison cell to um, United States President Joe Biden. And O'Reilly was wrestled to the ground by members of the police outside the castle, where a banquet celebrating Biden's visit was underway. We stand with O'Reilly and others who continue to fight for justice for Assange. And finally, to finish us off for international, something that hasn't been reported on by mainstream media is that Cuba recently had its general elections, which had a 78% turnout, which is actually much higher than OECD countries' average of 65%. And half of the candidates were chosen directly from local elections, while the other half came from nominations from various parts of society, such as workers, women and farmers groups and the elected representatives um, of which 20 percent are people aged 18 to 35 took office last week and you can find all of the stories that we've talked about today listed in the description or go to greenleft.org.au for more I'm getting really excited, Ben. Do you know why? Why is that? 
because we're getting closer to Eco-Socialism 2023, a world beyond capitalism. So it's taking place in Nam on the weekend of July 1st and 2nd, and it's set to be an incredible conference bringing together international and local activists, academics and campaigners to discuss the ecological, economic and political crises of this time and work out how we can campaign for a world beyond capitalism. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. We've got Japanese Marxist academic and author of Capital in the Anthropocene, Kohei Saito, who's going to be zooming in as the keynote speaker. And we've also just announced that Clifton de Rosario, who's from the Communist Party of India, Marxist-Leninist Liberation, he's going to be speaking about the fight to save democracy in India in response to the increasingly autocratic Modi government, and as well as his experience in the campaign to unionise and fight for rights for Dalit sanitation workers in Bangalore. Yeah, there's going to be a lot more speakers, panels and other details announced soon. So head to ecosocialism.org.au to book your tickets today. Green Left runs on people power, so we don't accept corporate donations or advertising. So we need your support to continue. You can become a supporter for only $5 a month and it's only $10 a month to get the hard copy paper delivered to your door. You can also donate to our 2023 fighting fund which will help us make more content like this. Go to greenleft.org.au forward slash support to help us out. And remember to follow Green Left on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok for the latest news and analysis. Thanks for listening.